Hello out there, all my bookish friends in booktube land. Welcome, welcome. In this episode of Tristan and the Classics, we're taking a look at Shakespeare's play Richard III, Act 1, Scene 2, better known as The Wooing of Lady Anne. So, without further ado, let's dig in, shall we? So Act 1, Scene 2 of Shakespeare's play King Richard III is um, quite rightly deemed um, an exceptional piece of literary work. It excels in the development of character as we see the malevolent Richard transform himself into an angel of light, as it were, because there is a lot of play about heaven and hell, God and devil, light and dark in this this scene of repartee and wit and device back and forth between two characters. This might be a long video because we're going to look at the entire scene. So this is especially good if you are going to see the play and want to understand what's going to happen, or if you're studying it at college level or maybe for GCSEs at high school. Um, I encourage you to get the play out. And what we're going to do is just go through it section by section so that we can understand what Anne and Richard are talking about and appreciate some of the great back and forth banter that Shakespeare got out of his characters. Also looking at some metaphors and understanding um, maybe more subtle references. Just to say, if you haven't already watched it, I'd recommend, as a primer to this video, you take a look, I'll put it up here, at my discussion of the opening scene, Act 1, Scene 1, of the same play, which presents Richard um, directly to the audience in soliloquy, telling us he is a bad guy and he is determined to be a villain. Now, though, let's just give some background information on the play. Of course, as I say in my other video, this is set in a sort of a period of respite in the famous Wars of the Roses between the mighty houses of Lancaster, the Red Rose, and the House of York, the White Rose. Now, we're just going to cover a couple of names that are going to come up in this scene so that we can understand them. To start with, we have Henry. Now, Henry will appear in this scene dead in an open coffin being carried along towards St. Paul's to be buried. Henry is the king of the House of Lancaster, Henry VI. A lot of the trouble around the War of the Roses was because Henry VI um, had moments of madness and couldn't be relied upon to govern. And so the great magnates around him vied for control. Now, at last, the Yorkists have killed Henry VI. Be done with it. He is being accompanied by his daughter-in-law called Anne. We won't go into too much detail, but Anne has been married to Henry VI's son, who is called Edward. And at the Battle of Tewkesbury, the young Edward of Lancaster had been killed, even though he was only 17 years old. Now, the actual history suggests that George, Duke of Clarence, um, put him to death. However, there were histories which Shakespeare relied on which said that Richard Duke of Gloucester, soon to be Richard III, was actually the one that killed this young man. And so Anne has lost both her husband, the young Edward, and now her father-in-law, King Henry VI, both at the hand of Richard Duke of Gloucester. And he is referred to as Gloucester throughout the play until he becomes the king. Just to say in advance, there is another Edward in the wars, and that's Edward IV, king, head of the House of York. But that's not the Edward that's being talked about here. That's an Edward of Lancaster who was married to Anne. Now, Richard wants to grow himself in power. He wants to clutch the throne. And to have Anne, Anne was the daughter of an extraordinarily powerful magnate called Richard Neville, who was called the Kingmaker. She had vast estates, and being linked to her family name would really strengthen Richard's position. And so he's got his eyes set on marrying her. But of course, how can he when he's just killed her husband, as she says? 
And that's what this scene is all about. How can this deformed, evil, wicked man who killed this woman's husband and the king be able to woo her, to win her over to his side? And follow along in your textbook if you've got the play or bring the play up online and follow through with me. Enter the corpse of Henry VI with gentlemen bearing halberds to guard it. Lady Anne being the mourner. Uh, halberd is uh, a long pike kind of instrument. Anne speaks. Set down, set down your honourable load. If honour may be shrouded in a hearse. Whilst I awhile obsequiously lament the untimely fall of virtuous Lancaster. So what she's saying... She's got to a certain point and she's just told the men carrying the coffin, set down your honourable load. Well, it's honourable because it contains the highest status in the land, the King, Henry VI. And she, she says, if honour can be shrouded in a hearse. Um, it's inappropriate for a king to be there in a hearse, killed as he has been. So already she's taking the side of honour, of what is proper of a respect for kingship, something that uh, Richard has earlier said he would like to pluck down for himself. So he is ultimately unhonourable. And she says, while I obsequiously lament, well, obsequious often means cringing and crawling and sucking up, but when it comes to the dead, it's due honour, obsequious, to, to um, humble oneself before the great life that was which was the king's life. And uh, she talks about the untimely fall of virtuous Lancaster. He carries the name Lancaster because he was the head of the house, the king. And again, virtue is brought up, this virtue, honour. She's going to stand for what's pure and good. And she mentions the untimely fall, meaning that the king has been killed. He hasn't fallen by old age. Let's carry on. Poor key cold figure of a holy king, Pale ashes of the house of Lancaster, thou bloodless remnant of that royal blood, be it lawful that I invocate thy ghost, to hear the lamentations of poor Anne, wife to thy Edward, to thy slaughtered son, stabbed by the selfsame hand that made these wounds. What she's saying here, notice again how she says, poor figure of a holy king, and actually, Henry VI was not warlike, he was rather pious and religious. But we're setting up again this, Richard III is about to come in and he's already said that he's pretty much a devil. She will refer to him as a devil, which creates a great tension in the scene. And Shakespeare, as was his wont, uses that glorious figure of speech, poor key cold figure of a king. Um, what's so great about that being Shakespeare, cool as a cucumber was one of his things, but key cold, have you ever picked up a key? It's particularly cold, the metal. So it's saying that he's, he's dead, he's been dead a while. Pale ashes of the house of Lancaster. Well, the ashen color of the dead, but also the house of Lancaster seemed in an irredeemable state. It seemed as if the Yorkist house had won completely. They had crushed to dust um, the house of Lancaster by killing not only the king, but his only son, Edward, who is Anne's ex-husband, because he's dead now. And she says, thou bloodless remnant of that royal blood. It's a play on words that Shakespeare is using here. Bloodless because he's been stabbed, so he's been exsanguinated, so blood has come out of him. But also, true kingship comes through the bloodline. And now there is no genuine Lancaster. The last of the genuine Lancastrians would have been Edward himself, the king's son. Um, so by saying bloodless, um, Anne is making reference to the illegitimacy of practically anyone to become the next king. Then she says, be it lawful that I invocate thy ghost. Well, obviously spiritism and soothsayers and mediums were irreligious in the days because the Bible condemns them in the book of Deuteronomy but she wants Henry to know how she's feeling so she says be it lawful to invocate to summon up thy ghost so that you can see me weep over you and over my husband your slaughtered son Edward 
and it says there, stabbed by the self same hand. So the same person that killed Edward killed Henry. And that, of course, is Richard, Duke of Gloucester. We'll carry on with what she says. Lo, in these windows that let forth thy life, I pour the helpless balm of my poor eyes. So the windows that let forth his life are the, the cut marks, the deep wounds. They're like windows that let his blood out. The life blood let forth thy life. And she's crying like tears of balm to heal those wounds. She's saying, let me cry upon them. O oh, cursed be the hand that made these holes. Cursed the heart that had the heart to do it. Cursed the blood that let this blood from hence. So again, this three repetition that Shakespeare will use a lot. Um, it's a rhetorical device and it always works. She hammers home this point. Oh, cursed be the hand, cursed the heart, cursed the blood. Richard is already deformed, which is sort of a trope of being cursed anyway. So she's denouncing Richard, Duke of Gloucester. But did you notice that little um, rhetorical play of words in rhythm, the repetition of a, a word, cursed the heart that had the heart to do it. So curse the motivation of the person that had the heart to be able to murder a king. And she says, curse the blood that let his blood from hence. So curse the life that took his life. And then she says, more direful hap betide that hated wretch that makes us wretched by the death of thee than I can wish to wolves, to spiders, toads, or any creeping venom thing that lives. She makes this comment, more direful hap betide that hated wretch. Great bit of rhythm in that. More, <laughs> more direful hap betide that hated wretch. I mean, what a great line. She's saying, may worse happen to the wretch who killed you. And she says, that make, um, then I can wish to wolves, to spiders, toads, or any creeping venom thing. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting choice of words. She's saying, I want worse to happen to the one who killed you than I would want to happen to wolves and toads and spiders. Now, why these particular things? Well, in the Bible, creeping things are referred to as unclean. But specifically, wolves, spiders, and toads, which all hold on the same line, in, are all linked to witchcraft. In Macbeth, um, the wolf's howling is linked to Pale Hecate, which is the moon, the moon goddess, but she's to do with um, witchcraft. Toads and spiders. Well, these are linked to witches' hovels. Uh, witches use them for their poison. Um, spiders and toads are viewed as poisonous. So Richard is being painted as this grotesque, ugly, poisonous, venomous, dark, witch-like, devil-summoned character. And let's carry on. If ever he have child, that is, if ever the man who killed Henry and her husband Edward has a child, abortive be it. In other words, let it uh, miscarry. Prodigious, which is ugly, unnatural and untimely brought to light. So early birthed, uh, premature, so it may be undeveloped like Richard III himself was. Whose ugly and unnatural aspect may fright the hopeful mother at the view, and that be heir to his unhappiness. If ever he have wife, let her be made more miserable by the death of him than I am made by my young lord and thee. So what's she saying? If ever the man who killed you, King Henry, and my husband, young Edward, if ever he have a child, let it be abortive. Let it be brought forth early into life, premature, deformed, prodigious, unnatural, loathsome to look at, so it may frighten the mother looking at this baby instead of bringing her joy. And whoever marries Richard, let her have more unhappiness then Anne has got weeping over her own husband and father-in-law. Now, what happens is she simply says, Come now towards Chertsey with your holy load, taken from Paul's to be interred there. So Paul's is St Paul's. They're taking the king from St Paul's to Chertsey, where he's to be entombed. 
now enters Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Stay, you that bear the corpse and set it down. So stay means stop, pallbearers, and put that coffin down. Now remember, his brother is the king, so he is a very powerful man and they would have to do what they were told. Anne says, what black magician conjures up this fiend to stop devoted charitable deeds? What black magician? Black magic. The devil's work. What black magician conjures up this fiend? Where did you come from? Did Satan call you out of the smoke of hell right now to appear to stop devoted charitable deeds? Well, the charitable deeds is going to bury the honourable and godly King Henry VI. And to stop that happening, someone must be a devil conjured by black magic. And that's what she's saying Richard is. Richard says, Villains, set down the corpse, or by St. Paul I'll make a corpse of him that disobeys. So the men who are carrying the corp uh, the men who are carrying the coffin have not put it down at Richard's order, and he's saying, You put it down, or I'll make a corpse of you. I'll kill you if you disobey. One of the gentlemen now speaks. My lord, stand back and let the coffin pass. So one of those in the entourage of Anne has told Richard to back off and let the coffin pass. Richard says, Unmannered dog, standest thou when I command? In other words, where's your manners and standest halt when I command you to halt? Advance thy halberd higher than my breast, or by St. Paul I'll strike thee to my foot and spurn upon thee, beggar, for thy boldness. Advance thy halberd. So, this man has told Richard to step back and put the halberd point at Richard's chest as a threat. And Richard has said, advance that higher than my chest. In other words, lift it up, away from me, no more threats, or I'll knock you down and spurn upon you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, knock him down could kill him or, or humiliate him in the dust. Now Anne speaks again. What? Do you tremble? Are you afraid? So she's saying that to the men because evidently they've pulled the halberd up. And she's saying, do you tremble from him? There's more of you than him. Are you afraid of him? And then she says, Alas, I blame you not, for you are mortal, and mortal eyes cannot endure the devil. Avaunt, thou dreadful minister of hell. Thou hadst but power over his mortal body, his soul thou canst not have, therefore be gone. So what she's saying? She's saying, well, the reason the men tremble is because humans can't bear to look upon the devil, and Richard is the devil incarnate. And then she tells, avaunt, clear off, vanish, go. It's almost like expelling or exercising a demon. And she says, thou dreadful minister of hell. So, a demon. You had power over his mortal body. So you were able to kill his mortal body, but his soul, his eternal well-being, you can't touch. So leave. So you can see she's dead set against Richard. She hates Richard. This is where Richard starts talking to Anne and he wants to win her over. He wants to woo her to make her fall in love with him. And you think, how can that be possible? Not only must she hate him, but he's doing it in front of the corpse of her father-in-law, whom he killed. And what we're going to see is almost Shakespeare... He makes Richard more magnetic through this. Shakespeare almost demonstrates Richard's witchcraft, his ability to beguile, to transform into an angel of light, to have an irresistible, almost devil-given gift to manipulate people. Because he's deformed. He's got nothing going in his favour. And yet here he tries to woo Anne, who hates him. And just watch the brilliant back and forth and how he handles her. Sweet saint, for charity be not so cursed. So in other words, sweet saint. She, he's, she's referring to him as a devil. He's taking that up and saying, you're a saint. But for charity be not so cursed. So out of charity, out of goodness, uh, do not speak like that. She says, foul devil, 
for God's sake hence and trouble us not. For thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. If thou delight to view thy heinous deeds, behold this pattern of thy butcheries. We'll just stop there, because she does carry on. So he called her sweet saint, she says fell devil. This brilliant counterbalancing, this direct opposite forces coming into play, dark v light. And she says, for God's sake, hence. He said, for charity, don't speak so cursed. And he, she says, for God, clear off. And she says, thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. So he's created what was once a happy realm. He's the chief instigator of trouble in her eyes. And he delights in the wickedness. He loves the deep exclaims. He loves the crying out. Imagine the tortured souls in hell. Think of Dante's uh, Inferno. She says, you make it that. The weeping and the crying out and the pain. You love it. That's what you've made. And then she says that if you delight in heinous deeds. So in other words, if you delight in what is wicked, if you're a sadist, Basically, if you love seeing what you've done, that's horrible. Behold the pattern of thy butcheries. So behold the stab wounds that you've placed in King Henry. Now Anne says something interesting. O oh, gentlemen, see, see, dead Henry's wounds open their congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Now this is interesting. As they're talking, the blood from Henry has seeped out of some of the congealed wounds again. Now this can happen, but back in the medieval period, it was believed that if the murderer of a person turned up to see their corpse, the corpse would begin to bleed as a witness against this person that they are the murderer. And so she's saying to all those around her, look gentlemen, proof that Richard was the one who actually killed King Henry because his wounds bleed afresh in his presence. He's condemning Richard from beyond the grave, as it were. Now she says to Richard, blush, blush, thou lump of foul deformity, for tis thy presence that exhales this blood from cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. It's just, just appreciate the rhythm of that for a moment. Blush, blush, thou lump of foul deformity. Blush, blush, turn red, be embarrassed. But blush, blush has this emphatic demand on Richard. Rather than saying, feel shame, thou foul lump of deformity. Blush, blush. She's crying this at him, shouting it. And calling him a lump of foul deformity refers to his hunch back and uh, his raised shoulder. And then that rhythm, for tis thy presence that exhales this blood from cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. So your presence pulls forth, the wounds are exhaling blood, spitting forth blood. Your presence is pulling that forth, the blood, from veins where there is no blood, because he's been stabbed, he should have been drained of blood. So you're bringing out blood where there isn't any. Thy deeds inhuman and unnatural provokes this deluge most unnatural. So she's saying that his deeds, now in warfare you can kill. That's not unnatural, but it is unnatural to kill a king who is in your charge, which is what she's accusing Richard of. So this is unnatural and it provokes this deluge, this bringing forth of blood, which is unnatural. It shouldn't be happening. He's been dead too long. O oh God, which this blood madest revenge his death. O earth, which this blood drinkest, revenge his death. Either heaven with lightning strike the murderer dead, or earth gape open wide and eaten quick, as thou dost swallow up this good king's blood, which his hell-governed arm hath butchered. A beautiful piece of speech again by Anne. What's so powerful about Anne being eloquent with words, especially indicting words and curses towards Richard, is she's not a pushover for him to win. She's got great presence of mind and great capability and great soul. So she's not an easy person to conquer in a, in a repartee. Her words here are very suggestive of scriptural connotations here. So, O oh God, which this blood made. So the blood that's pouring out of Henry, God made this. Revenge his death. 
and earth which this blood drinkers because the, the blood's dripping onto the floor revenge his death now her reference here is likely to none other than the story of Cain and Abel because later in the scriptures it says that the blood of Abel who is murdered by his kinsman Cain um, it says that Abel's blood cries out to God for vengeance and she's referencing that so by extent she's saying this man is as innocent as Abel and Richard who is connected to the throne by blood is like the wicked Cain, the brother of Abel. She's invoking the same demand from God to answer the blood of Henry with the blood of Richard. So do justice. And then there seems there could possibly be another reference to the Bible. This either heaven with lightning strike the murderer or the earth open up and swallow him. Again, in scripture, in the book of Numbers, you have an incident where some some of those who rebel against God's um, authority and the ones whom he chose to rule, interestingly, some were struck from a pillar of fire, like lightning. And there was an earthquake which swallowed a load of other rebels in the camp of Israel. So why this is interesting is because Shakespeare is adding to this constant war of God and devil. God and devil. Everything is light and dark. He calls her a saint. She calls him a foul devil. She asks what black magician conjured him up. Um, she puts him from the bowels of hell. And now scripture, this king is Abel, you are Cain. This king was rightfully appointed by God like Moses. You are a rebel who deserves to be swallowed into the ground or struck by lightning. You see, Shakespeare is keeping an immense tension there's no shades of grey between them. They are implacable enemies. And that's what makes the rest of the scene so powerful. Now Richard speaks. Lady, you know no rules of charity which renders good for bad, blessings for curses. Now what's Richard saying here? He's saying, whoa, Lady Anne, your speech is very vehement against me. Since you're a saint and you make reference to the scriptures, doesn't the scripture say that you conquer the evil with the good, render good for bad, um, blessings for curses. So he's using the Bible in an incorrect way. He's turning it. Now, what's interesting again is in Scripture, the devil does this with none other than Jesus, where he tries to convince Jesus to do wrong by saying it is written using the Bible. So again, Shakespeare is making Richard deliberately devilish. He would even go so far as to twist the word of God. But he's using it in order to get into a play of words, uh, a battle of the brains, as it were. Anne says, Villain, thou knowest no law of God nor man, no beast so fierce but knows some touch of pity. So you're a villain. You don't know any law, whether God's or man's. You're a law unto yourself. Even a beast can feel pity, not you. And Richard says, but I know none, which means no pity, and therefore am no beast. So he's trying to catch Anne out. She says, no beast so fierce, but knows some touch of pity. Even a beast can feel something. And he says, well, I feel nothing, so I can't be a beast. She answers him back. Oh, wonderful when devils tell the truth. She's saying, nice try, but the devil is neither beast nor man. So acknowledging you're not man nor beast admits you're a devil. And so Anne's saying, oh, wonderful, not only are you admitting you are a devil, but devil's telling the truth. You're saying you're a devil and you're right. The devil telling the truth, isn't that amazing? Now Richard replies, more wonderful when angels are so angry. Vouchsafe divine perfection of a woman of these supposed crimes to give me leave by circumstance, but to acquit myself. So first of all, she said, isn't it amazing when the devil tells the truth? And he says, not as amazing as when an angel is so angry. <laughs> then he says, vouchsafe, which means permit me to give an explanation of my side of things, um, to equip myself of the crimes you were accusing me of, which is killing Henry and her husband, Edward. Anne replies, vouchsafe diffused infection of man, of these known evils, 
but to give me leave by circumstance to curse thy cursed self. So she says in response, permit me, not permit him to explain himself, but she, she says, permit me, diffused infection of a man, um, diffused spreading infection, plague of a man. He's a poisonous creature. Permit me, you deadly plague, to speak of these known evils. You don't need to explain them away because I know them to be true. I don't need to hear your explanation, Richard. Now Richard responds, Fairer than tongue can name thee, let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself. Do you notice how he keeps his cool all the way through? She is railing at him. She is raising her voice. She is really pouring imprecation upon, imprecation upon his head. But, but he says, fairer than tongue can name thee. That's what he's calling her. This, you're so sweet. Please let me just have a moment to explain myself. She says, and notice the play against fairer than tongue. She says, fouler than heart can think thee. Thou canst make no excuse current, but to hang thyself. So he's saying, oh fair one, let me explain myself. She, she's saying, fouler than heart can think thee. So he called her fair, he, she says you're foul. She says that he has no excuse current. He has no current excuse for what he's done except to hang himself. If you want to excuse yourself, hang yourself. So see this play on words. Let, allow me to excuse myself, give reason for what I've done. And now she's saying, if you want to make an excuse for what you've done, if you want to excuse or get rid of what you've done, hang yourself. That would be penitence. That would pay the price. Richard says, but such di by such despair, I should accuse myself. So if I hang myself, I'd, I would accuse myself of actually doing the crime. And says, and by despairing shalt thou stand excused for doing worthy vengeance on thyself that didst unworthy slaughter upon others. So she says, by despairing, so by killing yourself, you shall excuse yourself from blame by killing the person who killed this one here. In other words, killing yourself. Richard says, say that I slew them not. Say that I didn't kill them. Anne says, then say they were not slain, but dead they are, and devilish slave by thee. So Richard says, say I didn't kill them, and she says, then say they're not dead. If you didn't kill them, then they're still alive, aren't they? But they are dead, and by your devilish hand. Richard then says, I did not kill your husband. Anne says, why, then he is alive. So if you didn't kill him, then he's alive somewhere. Richard says, nay, he is dead and slain by Edward's hands. Now, there's, here's the other Edward. Remember, Anne has lost her husband called Edward. This Edward that's being talked about is Richard's older brother, King Edward IV of York. And he's saying, yes, your husband are dead, but killed by my older brother, not by me. Anne replies, in thy foul throat thou liest. Now, just a word here. If you ever want to call someone a liar, how much more powerful and better is that? In thou foul throat, thou liest. That's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> Queen Margaret saw thy murderous falchion smoking in his blood. The which thou once didst bend against her breast, but that thy brothers be to side the point. So what she's saying, she says you're a liar because Queen Margaret, wife of King Henry, who's dead, saw your falchion, that's a curved sword, steaming in or smoking in his blood. That's the steam when he's stabbed. And she says, it's the, it's the same sword that you put against Queen Margaret's breast to kill her. But your brothers, Edward and George, Duke of Clarence, stopped you, knocked the point aside. You would have killed her as well. Don't say someone else killed my husband and killed Henry because you were seen doing it. Richard now changed tack. I was provoked by her slanderous tongue that laid their guilt upon my guiltless shoulders. So he's saying, the reason I put a sword against Margaret was because she provoked me by laying guilt for the murder of people on my shoulders when I hadn't killed them. Anne says, thou was provoked by thy bloody mind. 
that never dreamst on aught but butcheries. Didst thou not kill this king? So he says, the reason I put a sword against Queen Margaret was because she provoked me by saying I killed young Edward, your husband down. And she says, she didn't provoke you. Your mind provoked you. Your mind, your bloody mind, which dwells on nothing but butchery. You love war. And he has said this in scene one. She says, that's what provoked you. You just wanted more. You just wanted to kill again and again, even a woman. And then she says, didn't you kill this king? And Richard says, I grant ye. In other words, yes. Dost grant me, hedgehog? Then God grant me too, thou mayst be damned for that wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle, mild and virtuous. So she says, dost grant me, hedgehog. <laughs> hedgehog, abomination, as in he's ill-formed. But also, Duke of, uh, Richard Duke of Gloucester's coat of arms had a boar on it. A, a, a wild boar which had a spiky back, so it looked like a hedgehog. So she's playing on, on that livery. And she says, God grant me that you can be damned for your wicked deed. And then she looks at Henry and says, oh, he was gentle, mild and virtuous compared to this dark, malevolent man who loves butchering people. Henry is saintly, godly, gentle, mild, virtuous. I love what Richard says next. The better for the king of heaven that hath him. <laughs> now that's brilliant. He's saying, well, if he's gentle, mild and virtuous, it's all the better that he's up there with the Lord, who, who's got this nice, lovely man with him now. It's better that he's in heaven. Anne replies, he is in heaven where thou shall never come. Can you see this constant back and forth? There's a playing on words, almost punning on words all the time. And they're taking up each other's comment and moving along with it and twisting it back and forth. It's a battle of wits. This is sword play of the mind. And so she's trying to slay him mentally and morally. And he's parrying and he just wants to make one killer push to win her over. So it's, it's a genuine battle going on here. Again, we've already seen this dark versus light, this good versus bad, this God versus the devil. But it's almost the, the women wouldn't have fought on the fields of battle. But here, there's a battle going on between Anne and Richard. So she just says, um, he is in heaven where you shan't ever go. And Richard says, let him thank me that hope to send him thither, for he was fitter for that place than earth. If he's in heaven... Henry should thank me for sending him there. I mean, he was better suited for heaven than earth because he was useless as a king. He was too soft. And Anne says, and thou unfit for any place but hell, speaks for itself. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it, says Richard. So she said, you are unfit for any place but hell. But Richard says, there's one other place I'm better fit for than hell. He doesn't try and ward off being a devil. So she says, some dungeon. Richard says, your bedchamber. I mean, now that's brazen. That's bold, forward, up front, isn't it? There's one place better than hell for me, and that's your bedchamber, Lady Anne. Anne says, ill rest betide the chamber where thou liest. What Anne is saying is, wherever you lie, ill is there, and may a curse follow it. And Richard says, so will it, madam, till I lie with you. So, you're right, wherever I lie in a bedchamber, ill is there, until I lie with you. My life is woeful without you, and wherever I sleep, I shall feel bad and low and depressed, until I lie with you, and then all will be better. And Anne says, I hope so. So I hope you'll always be in pain and in ill, because you'll never lie with me, so I hope so. Richard changes it, says, I know so. But, gentle Lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our wits and fall something into a slower method, is not the causer of the timeless deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner? So he's saying, I know I will end up in your bedchamber, which is, again, quite a bold statement and can be quite magnetic in its way. So Richard says, let's slow down this battle of wits now. Let's move into something slower. Let's talk seriously. 
isn't the person, if there is a person behind the killing of these two men, the reason for killing your husband Edward and his father-in-law Henry, aren't they as bad as the executioner themselves if they give cause for it? And Anne says, thou wast the cause and effect of it. Um, so she's saying, you're the cause and you effected the murder. But now listen to what Richard says. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty that did haunt me in my sleep to undertake the death of all the world so I might live one hour in your sweet bosom. Whew, hot stuff. He's saying, you're guilty for their deaths because it was your beauty that drove me to murder them. I wanted you and I would kill the whole world if it would give me just one hour in your sweet bosom, in your embrace. That's quite flattering. He's also still playing the defensive parrying of wit because he's placing the blame of her husband's death on her. So she says, if I thought that, I'd tell thee homicide, these nails should rend that beauty from my cheeks. She calls him a homicide. If I believe that, you murderer. That's what homicide means. These nails would rend my beauty from my cheeks. So in other words, if I believe that it was my beauty that caused you to kill my young husband Edward and his father-in-law, I would tear my face so that I would no longer be beautiful. And Richard says, these eyes, meaning his own eyes, could never endure that beauty's wreck. You should not blemish it if I stood by. As all the world is cheered by the sun, so I by that. It is my day, my life. So... I, my, I couldn't endure seeing you ruin your beauty, sweet Anne. And as long as I stood near, I would never let you damage your beauty. Just like the world is cheered when the sun comes up. So your beauty does that for me. You are my day, my life. You are my sun. I mean, he's quite romantic, isn't he? Anne fights back. Black night, o'er shade thy day, and death thy life. So he said, you are my day and my life. She says, black night, or shade it. So may the darkness come over it. May your day be ruined and your life overtaken by death. She's still cursing him. Richard says, curse not thyself, fair creature. Thou art both. So she said, I hope your day turns black. I hope your life is taken by death. And he says, don't curse yourself, Anne, because you are my day. You are my life. So if they're overshadowed, something bad will happen to you. And Anne says, I would I were to be revenged on thee. I wish it was true that I was your life and day, because I could revenge myself on you. She could kill herself. Richard says, It is a quarrel most unnatural to be revenged on him that loveth thee. It's not normal to want to have revenge on a man that loves you. Anne says, It is a quarrel just and reasonable to be revenged on him that killed my husband. So it's perfectly reasonable to have revenge on him that killed my husband. Richard replies, He that bereft thee, lady, of thy husband, did it to help thee to a better husband. So the person who killed your husband did it so that you could have a better husband. Anne says, His better doth not breathe upon the earth. Richard says, He lives that loves thee better than he could. So there is someone who lives who could love you better than Edward your old husband could. Anne says, name him. Richard says, Plantagenet. Now Richard's house is the house of Plantagenet. He is called Richard of Plantagenet. Anne says, why that was he? Now, what does she mean by saying that was he? The house of Lancaster and the house of York, their heads both go back to the ancient Plantagenet dynasty, which has the rightful claim on the English throne. And so Richard, as part of the House of York, is called Plantagenet. But Edward, Anne's deceased husband, Edward of Lancaster, is also called Plantagenet. So when Richard says the one who loves you is called Plantagenet, she says, well, that was he, that was Edward, Edward Plantagenet. Then Richard says, the self-same name, but one of better nature. So in other words, yeah, same surname but a better person. Anne says, where is he? Richard says, here. 
So he's presenting himself as the best suitor, one better than the husband he had killed. Her reaction is that she spits at him. And Richard, wiping it from his face, says, Why dost thou spit at me? Don't you love how he keeps calm? This is a man who will rage. This is a man who can murder and kill and scheme and plot. But when it comes to wooing Lady Anne, he shows this mastery of self-control, which makes him all the more worrying. Because he can give colours to the chameleon, as he said of himself in the play Henry the Sixth, Part Two, I think it was. Um, he says, I can give colours to the chameleon. He can change. He can shapeshift to become whatever he needs to be in order to accomplish his ends. So he's being polite here. So why dost thou spit at me? Anne says, would it were mortal poison for thy sake. I wish my spit was poison so that my spit could kill you. Richard responds, never came poison from so sweet a place. So if it's poison, well, poison normally comes from a bad place, something dank and horrible, but you are beautiful, Anne. Never could, if your spit was poison, never could it come from a more beautiful place, you. Now, now watch again, the playing, the bantering back and forth of each other's lines, Anne responds, never hung poison on a fouler toad. Out of my sight, thou dost infect my eyes. So, he says, never does poison come from a sweeter place. She says, never does poison hang on so foul a toad. Toads were thought to be poisonous. You know, the idea that if you pick up a toad, you get warts on your hands. So she's saying this poison, it's like the slime now hanging on the toady Richard. And then she says, thou dust infect mine eyes. Uh, just an interesting idea of the Elizabethan age. The feeling of passion of falling in love, but also the acquiring of disease was thought by many to come through the eyes. So uh, that going into a bad place, an ill place, and looking upon gross and sickly things could cause you to become sick. Um, but also looking upon beauty, the beauty goes in through your eyes and infects you with love. So she says, go away, you infect mine eyes. But the question I've got when I read this is, it's obvious she's saying, you infect me with disease, because didn't she call him a diffused infection, that spreading plague? So he's infecting her with his evil. But are his bold, amorous statements and his manner beginning to infect her eyes with feeling toward him? That's a question that comes up in this sentence. It, it seems obvious to start with, but it could be a dual plague now. Anne suggests so there may be a hint that Anne is on the turn slightly, but she's putting up her final bit of resistance. Richard says, Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine. So even if she's only saying... <laughs> Um, you infect my eyes, you're diseasing me just by looking on you. He's saying, I am, I am enamoured with you by looking upon you. Love has infected me by looking upon you. She carries on. Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead. Now, I personally interpret her tone beginning to change here. She could shout this, would they were basilisks to strike thee dead. Is she being a little more coy and playful um, in this witty exchange now? Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead? Has he softened her down? What do you think? It's an interpretation when you read um, the play at this point. But a basilisk um, is a, a monster snake which has eyes which if it looked at you directly you would turn to stone. He says, when I look at your eyes, it makes me fall in love. And she says, I wish my eyes were basilisk eyes and turn you to stone or kill you. Richard now gives a mini speech um, to Lady Anne to convince her that he truly does love her. And the one thing that's potent about forthright statements is we all like to be loved. And even if the person's a monster, we're, we're not impervious to words. So let's listen to what Richard says. Well, I would they were that I might die at once, for now they kill me with a living death. Those eyes of thine from mine have drawn salt 
tears shame their aspects with store of childish drops. These eyes, which never shed remorseful tear. We'll just stop there. What Richard is saying, I wish your eyes were basilisk's eyes. I wish you could strike me dead because now I am in a living death. I can see you, I see your beauty, and to me I want you and I love you. And if I cannot have you, my life is more painful than death. And then he says, those eyes, your eyes, Anne, have drawn from mine eyes salt tears. So he weeps. He, he's affected. He's moved with emotion for her beauty and his love for her. But more than that, it says that those tears of his have shamed the aspects of his eyes. So shamed, you can see the tears in his eyes coming out of his eyes. So it's put shame upon him as a man, a mighty man, a, a warrior, to cry. But he says, you've put shame with childish drops. Um, so you've turned me into a crying babe. And then he said, these eyes which never shed remorseful tear. I have never cried before. Remorse, sadness, I'm above it. I'm too strong to give way to tears, but your eyes have drawn forth salt tears from my eyes. I mean, he's saying you are the most wonderful person on earth. I love you ardently with all my heart. You have a greater effect on me than anyone else. I mean, that's pretty good potent love stuff, isn't it? Now he's about to emphasize just how impregnable he is to being made to cry, that nothing makes him cry. So this amplifies, if Anne can make him cry, how much he must love her. Let's, let's carry on. No. When my father York and Edward wept to hear the piteous moan that Rutland made when black-faced Clifford shook his sword at him, nor when thy warlike father, like a child, told the sad story of my father's death, and twenty times made pause to sob and weep, that all the standers by had wet their cheeks like trees bedashed with rain. In that sad time my manly eyes did scorn an humble tear. And what these sorrows could not thence exhale, thy beauty hath, and made them blind with weeping. I never sued to friend nor enemy. My tongue could never learn sweet, smoothing word. But now thy beauty has proposed my fee, my proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak. Wow! So what's he saying? First of all, I've never shed a remorseful tear. And then he says, when my father and Edward, Edward is, this is not the Edward that Anne married, this is Edward Richard's brother, who is now king. When my father and Edward wept because they had heard how their younger brother had been killed by Lord Clifford. So Clifford shook his sword at him. Well, the younger boy had died. And of course, you imagine the pain for his brothers and for his father. They wept over him and they moaned. Richard says, that didn't affect me. Then he says, nor when thy, your warlike father, like a child, told the sad story of my father's death. So, Anne's father is the kingmaker, Richard Neville. He's actually dead at this point. He dies in the last play, but he's a marvellous character. And please, please, please go and check out my video on the kingmaker's death speech, because it's one of the greatest speeches you'll see a character make. The Earl of Warwick... Um, Anne's father, was the chief support to Richard's father's effort towards the crown. And for a long time, the kingmaker was on the House of York's side. Um, he, he switched places in the end. So you can imagine when Richard's dad died, it was the Earl of Warwick who came and told the boys. So Richard was there. You would have had George, Duke of Clarence. You would have had Edward, who has now become the king, Edward of York. Warwick would have told them all about their father's death. And it says that the Earl of Warwick 20 times made pause to sob and weep. So the Earl of Warwick kept breaking down, telling the story of, of Richard's father's death. It's so bad that all the standers by had wet their cheeks like trees bedashed with rain. Well, imagine trees dashed with rain, the dripping water, drip, 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 constant. Um, all those watching Warwick relate the story were weeping their hearts out over the death of the Duke of York, Richard's father. 
And yet, Richard says, in that sad time, my manly eyes did scorn and humble tear. So in other words, when my younger brother died, didn't bother me. When my father died and everyone, even the great mighty Warwick, the kingmaker, was bawling his eyes out, I scorned such a humble tear. Crying is too beneath me. He's so granite-like, he's so rock hard as a man that nothing can make him cry. And yet, he says, what these sorrows could not thence exhale. So what these, um, the death of his father and family, what they couldn't make him cry, thy beauty hath made them blind with weeping. So I can't be made to cry. And yet just your beauty, sweet Anne, fair Anne, has not only made me cry, but made me blind with weeping. I can't stop thinking about you. And so it would be better that I die than to live and not have you. And then last of all, just look at these sentences. He said, I never sued to friend nor enemy. So he never pleaded. He's never pleaded with friend or enemy. He's never had to work out a way to speak smoothly to coerce people to win them around. He says, my tongue could never learn a smoothing word. So in other words, I'm not a talker. I'm not one made for charming. OK, it's quite a lie because look what he's doing right now. However, he's saying I'm not made for charming. He says, but now that your beauty is my fee, in other words, now that if I can charm, I win your beauty as my reward, my heart sues. In other words, my heart argues, pleads, comes to you with its cause, and it prompts my tongue to speak. My heart, my heart so desires you, it's making my tongue speak, try to win you over with beauteous words. He's an ardent lover of Anne, so he said. Now, at this point, it says she looks scornfully at him. She still remembers he has killed her young husband, Edward of Lancaster. So she looks scornfully at him. Richard presses the point. Teach not thy lips such scorn, for it was made for kissing, lady, not for such contempt. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? She's looking at him scornfully, she's maybe raising her, uh, her lip. And he says, don't teach your lip such scorn. You are beautiful. That lip was made for kissing, lady, not for contempt. Contempt does not become you. You are beautiful. You are wondrous. You are charitable. You are saintly. Now Richard chances his arm. He, he makes a bold move, showing here that he can calculate the measure of a person. He says, if thy revengeful heart cannot forgive, lo, here I lend thee the sharp pointed sword, which if thou please to hide in this true breast. So now he's given her his sword and said, if you can't forgive me, if you cannot get rid of the taste for revenge, here is my sword. And he puts it on his breast. He puts it in her hand and puts the point on his breast and he says, if you please hide it in my breast. In other words, run him through kill me. Here he is trying to show that I absolutely do love you. You are in the midst of rage. You want revenge on me. Several times you have said you wish to kill me. Here is the blade. Kill me. And then he carries on. And let the soul forth that adoreth thee. I lay it naked to the deadly stroke and humbly beg the death upon my knee. So he says, hide the blade in my breast and let the soul forth. So um, the life is in the blood. If the blood comes out, then my life comes out with it. Let the soul forth, kill me, um, stab me. And he says, I lay it naked. So he's opened his jerkin so she can get a clean strike. There's no hidden chain mail underneath to protect him. And he says, I humbly beg the death upon my knee. So he's come right down and let her point the, the dagger as it were straight down on his heart. So he's chancing it here. She could actually kill him. It says here, there's a little instruction. He lays his breast open. She offers at it with his sword. So she gets herself ready to do it. It's in her mind. But she stutters. She hesitates. Because killing a man is much harder to do than saying you want to kill him. But Richard really shows his bravery and really shows his calculating manner as a manipulator, as someone who really knows what a person is going to do. Richard would not open himself up to be killed if he really believed the person would kill him. 
he knows she hasn't got the stomach to do it. So he says, Nay, do not pause, for I did kill King Henry. But twas thy beauty that provoked me. Nay, now dispatch, twas I that stabbed young Edward. But twas thy heavenly face that set me on. Wow. What's he saying? She puts the sword towards his chest, which is, is put open, and then she hesitates and he says, Nay, do not pause. Don't hesitate. If you cannot forgive me, if I cannot love you and you will not love me, my life is worth nothing. Anyway, run me through. And then he provokes her by saying, I did kill King Henry, who's lying there, remember, in all of this scene. I killed him. And then he says, though, "'Twas thy beauty that provoked me, because I wanted you, and now that you're his daughter-in-law, although you've lost, although his son has died, you now come under his charge, and I want you, and he would not give you to me, so I killed him for your beauty. And then he says, "'Nay, dispatch, uh, kill me. It was me that stabbed young Edward, your husband.' Now, earlier he had said it was his brother, Edward of York, that had killed her husband. But now he's saying, it was me. I killed him. But his excuse, t'was thy heavenly face that set me on. Because you're so beautiful. And there's an interesting facet that you must remember here. For the bulk part of the Wars of the Roses, Anne's father, Richard Neville the Kingmaker, was on the side of the House of York. So Anne, growing up, knew Richard anyway. They had spent a lot of time together. And now he's using this to his advantage. It's almost like saying, I've always loved you. Your heavenly face. And then to see when, when your father went over to the Lancastrians and you were married by your father to this Edward of Lancaster, I killed him because me and you were meant for each other. I want you. I love you. Now, she's at a crossroads. If she can't kill him, she must forgive him. So what happens? Anne says, Arise, dissembler. Though I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Arise, dissembler. <sighs> she knows she shouldn't believe his words. A dissembler is someone who deceives. Um, they can change their face, a shapeshifter. But she's saying, get up, you deceiver. I can't, but I find it hard to believe you, but as much as I would wish you dead, I can't be the one who kills you. So Richard changes it another way. Then bid me kill myself and I will do it. So he's saying, if you can't kill me, tell me to kill myself and I'll fall upon my own sword. He's really trying to convince her that she is his everything. She responds, I have already. I've already told you that I wish you dead and you should kill yourself because she said go and hang yourself right at the beginning of their conversation. Richard responds, that was in thy rage. You were angry when you said that. Speak it again. And even with the word this hand, which for thy love did kill thy love, shall for thy love kill a far truer love. To both their deaths shalt thou be accessory. So he's saying, when you told me to kill you before, that was because you were absolutely raging and mad in the heat of temper. Now that you've cooled down, tell me to kill myself coolly, with meaning, and I will do it. And he says, this hand, which for thy love killed thy love. So, my hand, which to have your love killed your husband, your love. So this hand, which for thy love killed your love, shall, for your love, kill a far truer love. So he's playing on the love emotion to the love meaning lover. So this hand, which killed thy, this hand, which to gain your love killed your lover, your husband, will, for your love again, kill a far truer lover, myself. And then he says... And to both their deaths, mine and Edward's, you will be the accessory to murder. Because it was for your beauty that all of this was done. Quite witty, isn't he? Anne speaks an extraordinary sentence now. I would I knew thy heart. I wish I knew your motives. I wish I knew whether you speak truly. 
Richard says, "'Tis figured in my tongue. What I say is what is in my heart. I love you." Anne says, "'I fear me both are false.' Richard says, "'There never was man true. Then there's never been a truth speaker, since this is the uttermost truth." Anne says, "'Well, well, put up your sword. Because at this point, he's picked up the dagger which she dropped, or the sword, and he has put it to his own chest, And because he said, I'll kill myself if you give the word. So she says, put up thy sword. Take the sword away from your chest. Before he does, though, Richard says, say then, my peace is made. So say we are at peace, that you forgive me, before I move this sword away from my own chest. Anne says, that shalt thou know hereafter. Let me think about it. I will speak to you later about this. So she's already agreeing to see him again. Richard says, but shall I live in hope? Is there a chance you will fully forgive me and love me? Anne says, all men, I hope, live so. Shakespeare frequently did this. Um, a lot of the playwrights did back then, this playing on words constantly. He says, um, he says, shall I live in hope? And she says, all men, I hope, live so. It's just playing with the words. But she's saying, well, all men should have some hope. So he's, she's actually tacitly saying, you can have some hope that I might be won over by you. Richard then puts his sword away and says, vouchsafe to wear this ring. So he grabs her hand and he puts a ring on her finger. Look how my ring encompasseth thy finger. Even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart. Look how the ring I put on your finger circles it. Just the same, your breast encircles my heart. My heart is in you. Wear both of them. Wear both the ring and my heart. For both of them are thine. And if thy poor devoted servant may but beg one favour at thy gracious hand, thou dost confirm his happiness forever. So he's saying, wear both the ring and my heart because they both belong to you. And could I beg you to let me do one thing, which if you allow me to do it, will confirm my happiness forever. And she says, what is it? What's this one thing you want me to let you do? He says that it may please you leave these sad designs to him that hath most cause to be a mourner and presently repair to Crosby house. Just pause here. He's saying, the one favour I ask from you is to leave this sad scene, this sad designs of Henry in his coffin being taken to be buried, and leave this burial to the one who has the most cause to mourn this king. Me, because I killed him. I am the one that should be mourning over him. I am the one that should be repenting for what I have done. So if you repair, go to Crosby House and wait for me, I will sort this out. And then he carries on, he says, where after I have solemnly interred at Chertsey Monastery this noble king and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duty see you. For diverse unknown reasons, I beseech you grant me this boon. So, Anne, grant me this favour. Leave King Henry now and let me take him to the monastery in Chertsey and inter him and weep over him with repentant tears. See how he's showing I've got a soft side. I genuinely love you and I, I'm not a devil at all. Um, and I realise I've done wrong and you've helped me to see this. <laughs> and he says, for diverse unknown reasons, I've got my reasons, but I'll explain later. Um, I just beg you, let me have this favour of burying the king. Seems sensible enough. And so Anne says, with all my heart, and much it joys me too to see you are become so penitent. Trestle and Berkeley, go along with me. Wow, Anne is won over. She's been deceived by Richard because she says, with all my heart, I will let you bury this king. And if you're going to be repentant over him, it makes me joyful that you are not this devil summoned by a black conjurer. And then she says, Trestle and Berkeley, that's the two men who are with her. She says, come with me. Richard says, bid me farewell. 
say goodbye to me properly. Anne says, tis more than you deserve, but since you teach me how to flatter you, imagine I have said farewell already. So she's like, she knows she's been a little bit played, but she believes him. It's almost like she willingly wants to believe him now. And she's, she's saying, you teach me how to flatter you. Imagine I've already bid you farewell with peace. So Anne and her, her followers leave. Only the men left carrying the coffin remain. And the gentlemen say, towards Chertsey, noble lord. Richard says, no, to Whitefriars. There attend my coming. So he doesn't even take the king where Anne wanted him to be taken. It shows that all of this was a sham. But now what we're going to see in this play, which is so important, is a soliloquy by Richard again, which shows his confidence in his own power, that he has the ability to manipulate his way to success. And you begin to get a sense of his pride in himself and in his own greatness. And it's a marvellous soliloquy in itself. So let's just take this piece by piece, shall we? Was ever woman in this humour wooed? Was ever woman in this humour won? Notice the, the play, the rhetorical device of copying the rhythm of a sentence. Was ever woman in this humour wooed? Was ever woman in this humour won? It's almost poetical. It's lyrical. I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. <laughs> wow. So I'm going to get her, I'll marry her, but I won't keep her for long. She's not that important. She's a mere stepping stone to his ambition. And now he almost becomes swept up by his own brilliance. He can't comprehend what he has just done. He has won over this woman who hated his guts. It's almost as if Richard is now talking to us, the audience, as we see his inner thinking, to help us be drawn along by his character to think, could he really get the crown? Being deformed, being a nasty piece of work, having not only his brother on the throne, but another between him and the... Th but another brother, George, between Richard and the throne. Can he really reach the top? We've just seen something wondrous performed by Richard. And so Richard's marvelling at what he's just done, at his own brilliance. He says here, what? I, that killed her husband and his father to take her in her heart's extremest hate, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of my hatred by, having God, her conscience, and these bars against me, and I no friends to back my suit withal, but the plain devil and dissembling looks. So, do you understand what he's saying? What? Have I just managed to win Lady Anne over? I, when I've just killed her husband, I've just killed her father-in-law. She's cursing me. She's calling down heaven's imprecations on me. She wants me to die. She's crying. And the body of King Henry, its wounds opened and bled when I stood by, evidencing that I am the murderer. And I've got no one on my side to help me in my cause at all to win her favour, no one to whisper things in her ears about my goodness. The only person that's on my side is the devil and my dissembling nature. Bad looks or perhaps also my ability to beguile, my dissembling nature, my deceiving pleasant front. Let's carry on with what he says. And yet to win her all the world to nothing. Ha! is what he says and yet to win her all the world to nothing. In other words, everything against me, and yet I still won. And then he says, ha! He's delighted with how brilliant he's been. Hath she forgot already that brave Prince Edward, her lord, whom I, some three months since, stabbed in my angry mood at Tewkesbury? So has she forgotten her husband already? And he says that he killed him at Tewkesbury. That's the Battle of Tewkesbury. Afterwards, Edward of Lancaster was found. Um, and despite his pleas, he was put to death. And he said, I stabbed him in my angry mood. In other words, I didn't stab him in hot-blooded warfare. But after the battle, when I could have spared him. But I was annoyed with him, so I killed him. That's what he's saying. I that have just done that. Has she forgotten this man already? 
And then talking about the Edward whom he killed, he says, A sweeter and a lovelier gentleman framed in the prodigality of nature, young, valiant, wise, and no doubt right royal, the spacious world cannot again afford. So he's just said about Edward, a sweeter and lovelier gentleman you can't find. He was a lovely lad. And yet here's Richard, this demon incarnate, as it were. And then describing the young Edward, whom he had killed, he says he's young, he's valiant, so brave, he's wise. And then he says, I no doubt right royal. In other words, it's almost like Richard is saying the Lancastrians actually are on the side of right. They should be the kings. So he is right royal, which is basically saying that Richard and his family are imposters to the throne. But also that he himself, Richard, he doesn't have a claim on the throne at all. And he says, the spacious world cannot afford. So in other words, even though the world is vast, it could never make someone as good as this young Edward again. And then he says, And will she yet abase her eyes on me that cropped the golden prime of this sweet prince and made her widow to a woeful bed? So not only does she forget her husband so quickly, but will she really abase her eyes from this beautiful young man in his golden prime, will she turn her eyes lovingly upon me who is both deformed, wicked, and the one who killed her husband and made her widow to a woeful bed? I mean, beautiful use of alliteration there. Um, he made her a widow and a bed with no um, husband or partner in it is woeful, full of tears. She cries to sleep on her pillow. Will she look at me lovingly? The one who caused all this. This is wondrous. Then he says, On me, whose all not equals Edward's moiety. What he's saying is, me as a whole is not even worth a slither of what Edward was as a person. Moiety is a, a, a part of something. So I'm not half the man he was. Then he says again, On me, that halts and am misshapen thus. So he's saying, She's going to abase her eyes on me, who limps, that's halt, so he's got one leg shorter than the other, and am misshapen, so I'm deformed, I've got a hunch back. She's going to look on me with love. And then he exclaims, my dukedom to a beggarly denier. I do mistake my person all this while. He's delighted in this. My dukedom to a beggarly denier is saying, wow, sell my dukedom for a tenth of a penny, because a denier is a tenth of a penny. It's so absurd to sell a dukedom for a, a, a tenth of a penny, but it's as absurd that she will look upon me lovingly and kindly and forgivingly that has killed this beautiful, valiant young husband of hers. <laughs> my goodness. That's what he said. My goodness. My dukedom for a beggarly denier. And then he says, I do mistake my personal as well. I've misjudged myself. I'm underrating myself. You can see his pride growing, an arrogance in his being, and a, an overwhelming confidence in his ability to rise to the top. Upon my life, she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvellous proper man. So, wow, she manages to see something about me which is good and proper. I'll, I'll confess, I can't see anything good in myself, but she can see it. Albeit charges for a looking glass, and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. So he says, um, hmm, now that I've won her over, I can't be half bad. I'm going to go and buy a looking glass and take myself in, and I'll get some tailors to uh, clothe me properly so that I can look attractive. Now, this is really interesting because in Act 1, Scene 1, Richard actually says, I that am not shaped to court an amorous looking glass. In other words, I am ugly. I'm not designed to look into the mirror and stare with appreciation at mine own beauty. And yet now that Anne has seen something in him, he's beginning to feel a little bit more confident in himself. He says, I'll get a looking glass and I'll get some tailors to dress me nice, which is interesting because he says that he's not shaped for sportive tricks. In other words, he's not shaped for loving, for flirting, for courting. And this is all that he said in the opening scene. And now, because of his wooing of Anne, he's suddenly got a bit more confidence. He wants to make himself look a bit better. Let's carry on. Since I am crept in favour with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. 
So now that I feel a bit better about who I am and how I look and that I can charm this young Anne, I'll spend a little money to uh, keep myself looking prim and proper. So adding to all of Richard's other bad qualities, we've now got the growth of vanity coming in as well, and that will have an effect on him. It's his hard pride which really makes him so cruel, but this, this extenuation of pride into personal vanity is just the icing on the cake. But then he just says, as an afterthought, but first I'll turn yon fellow in his grave, and then return lamenting to my love. So first I'll bury Henry, and then I'll go back to my love. I'll go and find her uh, at the hoard that I've told her to wait at. But very interestingly, did you see, he didn't say, first I will bury King Henry VI. He says, first I will turn yon fellow in his grave. Well, that's an expression, isn't it? To turn someone in their grave. If the dead knew what you were about to do, they would turn in their grave. They would roil. They would revolt against what was about to happen. He is about to go and win Anne. Henry the Sixth is her father-in-law, who Richard killed, and so he would turn in his grave if he knew that Richard was about to go and woo his daughter-in-law and get her to marry him. So, so isn't that a clever play on words, a double entendre? I will turn him in his grave, so you can inter him and bury, but I can also turn the man in his grave if he knew what I was about to do. And then the last two lines, typical of most soliloquies of Shakespeare, he ends it with a rhyming couplet. Shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. And this again is a change in his perception of self, because in Act 1, Scene 1, um, Richard says that he spies his shadow to descant on mine own deformity. So normally he looks at his shadow in the sun on the floor to look at the hump on his back and to disparage himself because of his ugliness. And now he's saying, until I've got a looking glass to look at my new good looks, which I, I must have because Anne likes me, shine out, fair sun, put my shadow on the floor again so I can see it, and this time be impressed by myself. So that is Act 1, Scene 2, the wooing of Lady Anne. We saw the repartee back and forth. We see Shakespeare taking each sentence of each character and each one of them twisting that sentence to their advantage, a battle of wits. We see how the angry Richard from Act 1, Scene 1 can turn into this dissembling, calm, loving Richard in order to win Anne. We see how Anne is won over by the force of Richard's charisma against her better judgment. And then as soon as she's gone, we see Richard break his word. He doesn't take the king where he said he would go. He says he won't keep Anne for long, she's merely a stepping stone. And then this sudden burning pride, like the devil, because the devil's chief sin is the sin of pride. He elevated himself. And here we have Richard getting so proud that he even begins to think himself, a deformed man, some kind of beauty and wants to buy a looking glass and dress himself in fine clothing. And finally, this ability to feel delighted and to have joy in his life when he's manipulating others. It's part of what makes him the most enthralling, charismatic bad guy in literature. And you can't help but be drawn in by him. You know he is bad, but you're mesmerised that someone with so much against them can seem to rise so high and you want to know if he can become the king which is his ultimate ambition. So I hope that you've enjoyed this. It is a longer video than normal, but I hope it helps you if you're studying for the play for college or school and it helps you understand it, or if you're going to watch the play and you really want to get to grips with what's going on on the stage. Please let me know your thoughts on this video down below or your own interpretations of the scene. And in the meantime, I wish you joy in your reading.